I changed jobs uh, not so long ago, and uh, a bloke in the office called Keith came out. Did you, have you noticed that wherever you've ever worked, there's always a bloke called Keith? I think it's a legal requirement or something. Um, Keith came up to me and said, uh, a few of us are going for a drink at the pub at the end of the evening. Um, why don't you come and join us after work? Uh, and we'll get to know you a bit better. And I said to him, oh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, Keith, but I'm, uh, I'm giving a talk to the Ebbuvale Metallurgical Society on iron and steel making in the eastern Ukraine in the 1860s. And Keith looked at me for a second and said, look, David, if you're having an affair, just say. So I do, <laughs> so do realise that it's a slightly unusual topic. And actually, the Ebbuvale Metallurgical Society were a little bit disappointed because this isn't really about iron and steel making. I don't really know anything about it. Um, instead, I'm going to take you all on a little bit of a journey, um, a journey that spans more than 200 years and several thousand miles. And I'm going to start, though, right in the middle of it, in the 1930s. Um, and only about 15 minutes from my front door in Bargoid. Um, now, for those of you who know the place, you'll know that the main road in Bargoid is called Hambury Road. And in the 1930s, on a little side road, there was a, a little news agent run by a man called Percy. And it had been a, quite a successful little business when he first opened it, selling newspapers to the prosperous middle classes in Bargoid, because Bargoid had prosperous middle classes in the 1930s, and selling cigarettes, two at a time, to the miners, um, who were going down to the pit, one to smoke on the way down, and one to smoke on the way back. And there were more than two and a half thousand miners at uh, Bargoid Colliery, and another 1,700 at Britannia Colliery, just down the road in the Rumney Valley. So that was a lot of cigarettes. And the business did rather well. But in the space of a few years, at the start of the 1930s, the workforce at the collieries more than halved. Um, Percy and his wife, Gladys, had to start taking in lodgers. And now in our story, in the early 1930s, the business is going bust. And it's a very similar story for some of the other people that I'm going to introduce you to um, this evening. Uh, Edward Davis Watkins from Rumney. After his wife Annie died, he ended up as a door-to-door -door salesman. John John ended his days in a very small terraced house in Merthyr. And Thomas James, of all people, ended up working as a labourer. I'll introduce you to all those as we go along. Percy, the Bargoid news agent, was from Dowlais, near Merthyr originally. Uh, and he wasn't a small businessman by trade. He was a trained chemist. He'd come to Bargoid to work as an industrial chemist at the industrial bipod products plant. Then as the Great Depression really hit South Wales, um, Percy's boss just came in one day in the... Uh, Byproducts plant, Powell Dufferin Byproducts plant, and sacked Percy in the middle of the Great Depression uh, in order to create a job for his own son, for the boss's own son. And that's why Percy, who was a trained industrial chemist, ended up as a news agent and ended up, as, as we found out, as a news agent who was going bankrupt. And uh, I often wonder what um, his wife Gladys really thought about it all. They were living in a very nice house in Bargoid, in the posh street in Bargoid, which was called Hillside Park. But when they'd begun their married life, there had been an even bigger house, a mansion with servants, with um, a nursemaid, a gardener, a driver, a cook. But that had been more than 3,000 miles away and 15 years before, because Percy and Gladys um, they, their married life began not in Bargoid, but in Donetsk in the Ukraine, except it wasn't called Donetsk then, and it wasn't called the Ukraine either. 
uh, it was a town in Imperial Russia called Yuzovka. In Russian, Yuzovka is Hughesovka, the town of Hughes. There's no letter H in the Cyrillic alphabet. So Hughesovka became Yuzovka or Yuzovka, the town of Hughes. Um, it's one, I think it's one of the greatest adventure stories in Welsh history, yet hardly anyone has ever heard about it. The modern city of Donetsk um, in the Ukraine, which is the city of a million people, and uh, so they say a million roses. And in 2014, when you may remember there was a civil war in the Ukraine, uh, it became the city of a million bullets. The city of Donetsk was founded by Welshmen. I think it's one of the greatest little adventure stories in Welsh history, but hardly anyone has heard about it. The Hughes of Hughesovka, Yuzovka, uh, was John Hughes. Um, he was born sometime between 1812 and 1850. No one's quite sure exactly when. Uh, in Merthyr, where his father worked at the Cavarfa Ironworks. And John Hughes went into the same business, um, first of all in Ebrevale, and then at the Uskside Works in Newport. Now the Uskside Works, uh, they made their money out of making metalwork um, for, um, for the Navy, for ships, for chains, anchors, um, and for naval ships, armored plating. And John Hughes became their leading engineer. And when he was in his 40s, despite being only semi-literate, by all accounts, you had to write in capital letters if you wanted him to even half understand any written document. Despite that, in his early 40s, he was headhunted and given the chance to become uh, one of the directors of the Millwall Engineering Company in London. Uh, and it was at the uh, Millwall Company that he was responsible for developing the Millwall Shield, which was widely regarded as the best form of armor plating for naval ships anywhere in the world. And it made him his fortune. Um, now, ironclad ships um, like HMS Resistance here. Uh, weren't built of iron. They were ordinary wooden sailing ships, you know, with cannons sticking out the sides as if they were in the Napoleonic Wars. Um, but then iron plates were welded to the outside all the way round to give them protection. And the Millwall Shield, as it was called, that was made by the Millwall Ironworks, became known as the best form of iron plating for ironclad ships in the world. And the technique not only made Hughes his fortune, it also brought him into contact with the Russian government. They employed Hughes to um, not to armor plate their ships, but to armor plate their naval fort at Kronstadt. And the Russian government told Hughes that they discovered major iron ore and coal deposits in the Donbass region of southern Russia. But it was absolutely in the middle of nowhere, and they didn't have the expertise to exploit it. Now, when I say it was in the middle of nowhere, I mean in the middle of nowhere. This is a, a map of all the major conurbations in Imperial Russia in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, the red dot there is Moscow. And down the bottom, those orange dots from left to right, they are Kiev on the left, uh, then uh, in the middle is Kharkov, and the one that's on the right was called Tsaritsyn. Uh, today it's called Volgograd, but it's probably best known to us all as Stalingrad. And the distance between the, dot, the orange dot on the left and the orange dot on the right is more than 800 miles. So you can see the extent of this, and the green dot is where they found the iron ore and coal deposits. So you can see it's right in the middle, 
surrounded by hundreds of miles of nothingness. Um, now, Hughes bought the mineral rights in 1868. Uh, he had to pay a Russian prince rather than the Russian government, which shows you how corrupt Russia was even then. And when he visited the region, he found that they were, the way they were mining coal, they were simply hauling it up in wicker baskets using horses. And I don't know whether you can just see, if you look into the background of that photograph, you can see there isn't even a tree or a bush anywhere. It's just hundreds and hundreds of miles of dirt, parched in the summer, freezing cold in the winter. Hughes realized that he'd have to bring in his own experts to sink proper collieries and to build an ironworks from scratch. And that meant going back to South Wales. Now Hughes's project was called the New Russia Company. And it coincided with a, a massive downturn in the iron industry in Merthyr. Um, the place had boomed in the mid 19th century because of the demand for iron rails for, for railways. And the Welsh method, as it was known, of puddling and rolling iron, uh, made the ironworks at Cavartha and at Dowlais the most efficient of their day. But most of the main railways in the UK had been built by the time we got to the late 1850s and early 1860s. And the South Wales iron industry was laying people off left, right and centre. So even though he was asking them to travel to a place in the middle of nowhere that no one had ever heard of, and where the only population was a few scattered peasants living in abject poverty, the new Russia company was able to recruit 71 highly skilled workers. And the key man was John John of Dowlais, or John John Russia, as he became known to everybody. Um, he was Hughes's right-hand man, his fixer, and he knew how to identify the men that would be needed. It wasn't any good just taking out managers. They would need puddlers, miners, masons, boilermen, machinists. The Russian steppe, as we've seen, is just really, really poor scrubland. There isn't even stone there uh, for building. So they had to take out their own experienced brick makers just to make somewhere to live. And I've got to say that this, in my opinion, is the real story of Yusufka. There have been a number of books written about Yusufka. Uh, there was um, there have been a couple of television programs, even a radio play. And they all tend to concentrate on John Hughes himself. But I've got to say to me, the idea that then, by then London-based, very, very rich industrialist investing in a big industrial project on the continent um, wasn't that big a deal. The real heroes, the really brave people were the very ordinary South Walians who risked everything on a complete leap into the unknown. They were people like Edward Watkins, the mechanical engineer from Rumney. Willie Jones, a colliery engineer from Hengoid. Annie Gwen Jones, a young single woman in her teens from the tiny village of Vochru, high up above the Rumney Valley, who went out to be a tutor to Hughes's grandchildren. They had no idea what they were letting themselves in for. Uh, although, having said that, if you've ever been to Vochru, um, you, you might think that Annie Gwen Jones perhaps um, did know something about it was like to live the desolate wasteland. Um, Daniel Jenkins was another one, he of miners in Rumney, and he went out with those first pioneers out to Yusufka. Uh, ahead of his wife, and he wrote back to her 
uh, telling her about how everything was going and what it was like. And he sent her the money for the journey. So she packed everything up in a trunk and traveled down all the way down to on the Taff Vale Railway down to Cardiff to what would have been Knox Road Station was the terminus then where the where Cardiff prison is now. And then hauled her trunk all the way across Cardiff city centre to Cardiff General Station uh, to catch the mainline train to begin her journey. And so she sat on her trunk on the platform and the train pulled in and the train pulled out and she was still sitting on the trunk. She couldn't bring herself to take this complete leap into the unknown. And she returned to run the Butte Arms in Potlotin and tragically died at the age of 28 before Daniel ever saw her again. Well, they sank their, um, their first proper pits uh, in Yuzovka. And in 1870, they started on the first blast furnace and first hundreds and then thousands of Russians were attracted to do the relatively unskilled work. But it was the hands-on knowledge of these Welshmen that kept the project going. Welshmen who, um, judging by that photograph, were taking part in a sponsored hipster beard growing competition at the time. It took them four years to get the blast furnace right. And by then it was clear that it was already out of date. They needed to switch over from iron to steel production. And again, it was the new Russia company's reliance on Wales that made all the difference. There were two main methods of steel making the Bessemer process and the Siemens Martin process. Now Siemens was, was a German by birth, but his main works was at Landor in Swansea. And the Siemens Martin process was slower and more expensive than the Bessemer process. And the Landor works was going through a bit of a downturn at the time and was laying workers off. So they were the workers who were available. So Hughes opted for the Siemens Martin process uh, because it was the process that the steel workers that he could recruit understood. But it turned out to be a masterstroke because it produced higher quality steel. Now, um, Hughes originally thought that the, um, the main demand from his works would come just as it had for, for, for the Millwall Engineering Company and just as it had in the Usk side works in Newport, it would come from the military. It would be for armaments, shells, bullets, armor plated turrets. That's what they'd be building. But in the event, it was the Russian rail industry that had an almost insatiable appetite for the new Russia company's output. When you're building railways in the middle of the Russian steppe on the vast plains of Russia, uh, where it is furnace hot in the summer and anything up to minus 40 in the winter, you need to be confident of the quality uh, of the rails you are laying. Otherwise, they will crack in the cold or buckle in the heat. So you'll pay extra for higher quality steel. And led by this relatively small band of skilled Welshmen, the new Russia company had its first steel furnace up and running by 1876. And the works just grew and grew. And it wasn't just the new Russia company's steelworks that expanded. By now, the company's collieries were as modern and nearly as productive as anything in South Wales. And they had to be because the steelworks coke ovens 
look like this. And that's just one row of coke ovens. There were five. I don't know whether you can quite see this, but if you look carefully, there are five rows going all the way along, going all the way into the distance. And that's two and a half miles of coke ovens. And as the works grew, so more Welshmen, as well as a smattering of English, Scots, and the occasional Frenchman and German went out to Yusufka. And just to give you an idea of what an achievement this all was, I'd like you just to consider for a moment that Yusufka was 60 miles north of the nearest port. It was 200 miles away from the nearest paved road. So it rather begs the question, how do you get a blast furnace into the middle of the Russian steppe? Now this is an oxen train. There are 48 bullocks there. And I don't know whether you can quite see it off to the far right of the picture, but they are towing. It's not a blast furnace, but a boiler in this case, but the principle is the same. And they have towed that all the way across the ice and snow, 60 miles from the port of Taganrog on the Sea of Azov, right in the south of Imperial Russia. Now, um, we're all familiar with Port Albert steelworks. Just think how big Port Albert is. If you started walking at one end of Port Albert steelworks, it would take you about an hour and a quarter before you walked all the way to the other end. That's how big Port Albert steelworks is. Well, the steelworks in Yusufka grew to be four times the size of that. And they basically dragged the whole blinking lot across the ice and snow to build it. It was an absolutely remarkable enterprise. And that photograph was taken by my grandfather, uh, the aforementioned Percy Cartwright, the failed news agent as he was to become from Bargoid in the 1930s. Remember I said he was an industrial chemist by trade, really. He went out to Yusufka in 1903, when he was only 24 years old. And the link was provided by John John Russia. Um, the Johns were a Welsh speaking family and Percy's father was uh, a Welsh speaking printer and publisher who'd moved down from North Wales to Dowlais. And they knew the John family through the Welsh language chapel in Dowlais. And that's how Percy got to hear about Yusufka. Um, and he went out to join a team of 29 scientists working at the New Russia Company's works in Yusufka. And you can tell that he was a qualified scientist because this picture shows the international symbol of the qualified scientist, which is a white lab coat from behind the door. Now, um, he did very, very well for himself. But while several of the Welsh workers um, married local girls out in Yusufka and then brought them back to the UK, which is why, incidentally, there was a pupil at Rumney School in the 1890s called Vladimir Watkins. Percy did the opposite. He came back to Wales to find a wife and then took her out to Yusufka. Now, Edward Morgan was an elder at that same Welsh language chapel in Dowlais. He ran a grocer's shop at the top of Mount Pleasant Street in Dowlais. Uh, but his daughter, Gladys, uh, 
was very unusual. And that is because Gladys had been to university. Now, abreast with university didn't award degrees to women, that would be going too far. But they did allow women to follow the degree course. The little darlings could do all the coursework, sit all the exams, get in many cases much better marks than the men, but Aberyst with still wouldn't allow them to collect a degree at the end of it. But nevertheless, when Percy was introduced to Gladys, uh, who was a 25 year old schoolmistress in 1910, um, such an educated woman was something of a catch. And they married the following year. And I've got a picture of the wedding. Now, um, I don't know whether you remember back in 1911, uh, uh, 2011, um, at the royal wedding. Do you remember that the Middleton sisters uh, were said to have brought hats back into fashion? Now, can I just say that that is not a hat? That is a hat. This is Percy on the far right and Gladys together with Percy's brothers and sisters. So I've got my great aunt Sissy, who's standing next to Percy, who apparently was just as sour as she looks in the photo. Um, my great aunt Dora. Next to her is my great uncle Claude, who had sailed all the way back from the United States where he'd emigrated in order to be best man. And seated at the end is my great aunt Dorothy. Um, who was a sister of Gladys. Now, just imagine that that very pretty young thing holding the flowers in the middle is your daughter. Now, Percy, I mean, he seems like a nice young chap and all that, but he wants, her to, he wants to take her to a place that is 650 miles due south of Moscow. Uh, so what do you do? Well, for Edward Morgan, the grocer, the answer was to go on honeymoon with them. So there's Edward Morgan, the father of the bride in the boater at the front and Gladys on the far right of the photograph. Photographed there at Carnarvon Castle, where they had traveled on their honeymoon to visit some relatives up in North Wales en route to Aberdeen. And from Aberdeen in Scotland, they sailed across all the way across to, um, to Norway, from Norway all the way across Sweden and all the way into Finland, then travel right down to the south coast of Finland, sail across from there to Russia and from a port not far from St. Petersburg, then travel overland all the way down by train on the rails built by the new Russia company in Yusufka, all the way down to the town of Yusufka. That was a journey of 3,000 miles. And when they got there, Percy sent this cheery little postcard to those same relatives in North Wales. And I don't know what you can see, but right down the last sentence on the right says, Gladys doesn't seem to mind the place a bit. And it's not surprising that Gladys didn't mind the place. She'd gone from living over the grocer's shop at the top of Mount Pleasant Street in Dowlice to this, a multi-roomed mansion with views out over the open step. Um, and Although they arrived there uh, in September, and so within a month, all the leaves had fallen off the trees. Nevertheless, it's still nice to stroll around your private garden, your private orchard in the autumn, uh, knowing that you don't have to worry about picking the apples or sweeping up the leaves because you have servants to do that for you. And it seemed like a good place to start a family. And within 18 months, 
their little daughter Ella arrived. And you can do the proud father bit, confident in the knowledge that you have a nursemaid who will do the washing the dirty nappies bit. And while Percy is doing his career thing, you can go off to the exclusive resort down on the Sea of Azov with the other Welsh women and their children from Yusufka. And you can see Gladys in the white dress with her collar turned up in the middle. She looks suspiciously like she's rolling a cigarette, I think there. And next to her on her right is little baby Ella. And in 1912, when you've come back from your holidays on the Sea of Azov, um, in that exclusive resort, and you want to go down the shops, uh, you, you get your driver to bring the carriage round. But um, you need to make sure you've got your first stole handy, uh, because it gets cold in Yusufka. That's when it begins to snow. And when I say snow, I mean 20 feet of it, frozen hard sometimes for anything up to six months of the year. Uh, but when the, the going gets tough, the tough get Ivan to bring the sleigh round. And um, apparently his name really was Ivan as well. And the reason why a printer's son and a grocer's daughter were able to live like this in Yusufka is demonstrated by a man that I've mentioned before. Edward Watkins of Rumney. There is a remarkable little artifact in the South Morgan archive in Cardiff. It's right next door to Cardiff City's football stadium. Remarkable archive there. Um, it's his pay slip from October 1892. But it explains, this simple document explains exactly why these Welsh people were prepared to gamble everything on a new life in the middle of the Russian steppe. Now you can see from this that he earned 207 rubles and 28 kopecks in October 1892. And someone at the New Russia Company has very handily translated that into real money. So we can see that it was 20 pounds, 16 shillings and eight pence. Now that translates to 250 pounds a year. Now 250 pounds a year in 1892 is the equivalent of 140,000 pounds a year today. And the other thing that you have to remember is that in 1892, the vast majority of the population in the United Kingdom lived in what we would now consider to be poverty. The average salary in the United Kingdom in 1892 was the equivalent of only 5,000 pounds today. So Fast Eddie here was earning, and he was just doing a middle-class occupation. He was um, merely a mechanical engineer. He was earning 28 times the average UK salary. And the new Russia company made sure that those workers weren't just well paid, that they were very well looked after. There was the new Russia company private hospital, the new Russia company English language school, although for many of the children in this photograph, which would have been Welsh, there was the new Russia company funded parish church, which was called, as you might imagine, St. David's after the patron saint of Wales. There was the new Russia company tennis courts, the new Russia company golf course, the new Russia company boating lake. Got your cat stuck up a tree? Call the private new Russia company fire brigade. Um, this was the Hughes's 
family house in Yusufka. Though you'd be lucky to see any of the Hughes there by the time Percy and Gladys arrived. Uh, John Hughes was long dead. He had a stroke in St. Petersburg in 1889, and his sons lived mainly in St. Petersburg or, or back in London. I wonder what the 50,000 locals, because Yusufka as a conurbation grew just as fast as the steelworks had. Uh, I wonder what they thought when they looked at that house. That was in the so-called British sector, which had all these imposing mansions like this, and where every house had a view out over the open step. But the locals lived in places like this. These are just shacks built directly onto the top of the spoil tips next to the colliery and the steelworks. Uh, or like this, built of rubble with turf roofs. In fact, it's not even obvious that there are houses there until you look down at the left, left hand corner and see a little man poking his head out of his house with a turf roof. Um, if you were really lucky, you might live in one of these in the center of Yusufka. But these aren't individual houses. These are terraces of a, where up to 10 different families would all be crammed into each one of these buildings. No running water and with simply an open sewer outside. Those um, funny little things with chimneys on them in the middle of the road, just beyond those houses, are where you would take your human waste uh, and burn it in those furnaces because there were no sewers. Um, there were typhus and cholera outbreaks every year. Percy hadn't really come home to find a wife in 1910. There was a cholera outbreak. And he did what the Welsh community did in those circumstances. He left until it had passed. It was the Russians who stayed and died. That's if scarlet fever, smallpox or black water fever hadn't already done for them. Gladys had one of these. It's a bottle of scent that you'd wear around your neck when you went downtown. You would hold it up to your nose so that you didn't have to smell the smelly locals uh, at their rickety stalls in the local market or at their open air market where they just laid their wares on the dust. And by this time, the Hughes family weren't even major shareholders in the new Russia company anymore. They'd done what rich people do. They gambled big, but they then cashed in their chips and taken their profits. And they now moved in entirely different circles. John Hughes's son, Ivor, um, sold his shares and retired, retired to Ifield in Sussex, uh, to be near his string of racehorses. Uh, one of Hughes's grandsons became the sixth Baron Hillingdon. One of his granddaughters married a prince. It was the Welsh workers who were still in Yusufka and who were still gambling that the steelworks would still be an economic success. They were the ones who'd invested in all those opulent houses and who had their money in the banks of Imperial Russia. But by now in our story, it is 1917 and the game is changing. Already back in 1914, an awful lot of the men of uh, the Welsh community of Yusufka had gone back to fight in the Great War. And the rest in 1917 were now packing their bags as they were swept up by the Russian Revolution. One of the communist leaders in the local area was a young metal worker from the new Russia company's steelworks 
in Yusufka called Nikita Khrushchev, who later was to become the Soviet Union's leader. La the Tsar was deposed in the spring of 1917, and just as quickly as it had been established, before the summer of 1917 was out, the Welsh community of Yusufka was completely gone. Just about the last to leave was one young woman who was heavily pregnant. Um, while her husband legged it back home to Wales, she had to stay in Yusufka until she gave birth to the child. And even then, um, she called the child Sandy, little baby boy called Sandy, and born right in the middle of the Russian Revolution in July 1917, baby Sandy became the last person to be born into the Welsh community of Yusufka. They couldn't then leave straight away. The easy way to leave would be simply to travel west, but that would have taken the Germany in the middle of the First World War, so they couldn't go there. Um, they couldn't travel um, southwest, that would take them into Austria-Hungary, which Britain was at war with as well. If they tried to sail out to the south, they would straight away um, sail into the waters of the Turkish Empire. So they were surrounded by Britain's enemies in the First World War. So the only solution was to travel back up through Russia, right in the middle of the Russian Revolution, which was going on all around them. And once it was judged that baby Sandy was big enough for them to make the journey back, he and his mother began that arduous journey, but they couldn't just travel in a straight line. It was now much more than 3,000 miles. They had to zigzag their way all the way up to the northern ports, um, making sure that they managed to avoid the, the towns controlled by the Bolsheviks over here or the revolutionary socialists over there or the anarcho-syndicalists over there and gradually zigzag their way until baby Sandy and his mother managed to reach one of the northern ports and sail to neutral Scandinavia. It took them six weeks to get out. And by and large, the Welsh community lost everything. I've never been to Donetsk, modern day Yusufka. Um, I always promise myself that I will go one day. And when I go, I'm going to take a shovel because my grandparents, Percy and Gladys, apparently buried everything of value in the back garden. All they brought home was just a few trinkets. They lost the house, of course. Um, their money was trapped in banks in Imperial Russia, which were nationalized by the Bolsheviks, and their substantial shareholding in the new Russia company was to all intents and purposes worthless. And most of the Welsh community of Yusufka arrived home penniless. This is Thomas James of Cardiff. He earned so money out in Yusufka that he was able to buy his colliery. He liked to show everyone just how successful he had become. So he used to be driven to work each day through the streets of Yusufka in a carriage and pair. And here he is on his return to South Wales, working as a labourer in the repair shop of the Taffvale Railway Company at Canton in Cardiff. He lost everything. And there never were any grand reunions of the Yusufka Welsh Society. They quickly spread far and wide in search of work to places like Sheffield and Scunthorpe. Um, 
1924, Josef Kelmed Stalino in honor of the then new Soviet leader. In 1961, uh, the city decided that being named after one of the greatest mass murderers of history probably wasn't doing them any favors. So uh, they changed the name to its modern name of Donetsk. Now, Donetsk is a Russian name. And you may have noticed that I've referred to Russians throughout this, even though Donetsk is in Ukraine. Hughes's enterprise wasn't called the New Russia Company because the company was new. It was because it was in New Russia, Novo Russia. It was land that the Russians had annexed after beating the Ottoman Turks in battle only um, some five or six decades before Hughes went out there. And even though this area was quite clearly Ukrainian, where the people spoke Ukrainian, dressed Ukrainian, ate Ukrainian, the Tsar, when the mineral rights were sold to John Hughes, didn't want the Ukrainian peasants to get their hands on the mineral wealth. So the deal, and you know, sometimes John Hughes is um, portrayed as some sort of Welsh hero. But remember, he, he made his fortune in London. Uh, and this was the case of the Tsar of one imperialist nation uh, doing a deal with a very, very rich man uh, in the capital of another imperialist nation. And the deal was that the Ukrainians would remain as Yuzhik peasants. Um, and an ethnic Russian workforce would be brought in to the works at Yusufka. Uh, Nikita Khrushchev, for instance, came from a Russian village 400 miles away. And today, Donetsk is almost 100% Russian speaking. Now, um, you may remember that the civil war erupted in the Ukraine in 2014, when the then president ordered uh, his own snipers uh, from the military police to gun down the Ukrainian people who were demonstrating um, in the square in Kiev, were gunned down in cold blood in front of the world's television cameras. And that sparked the Ukrainian civil war. And that was in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. Um, and the then president of Ukraine was Viktor Yanukovych. Now Yanukovych, again, is a Russian name. And Viktor Yanukovych was the former governor of Donetsk modern day Yusufka. He was ousted and replaced by what became a ghastly coalition of um, the far right and neo-fascists in, in Kiev. That's Kiev where in 1941, the Nazis were welcomed with the traditional gift of bread and salt while in Stalino, as Yusuf Kerp on day Donetsk was in 1941, when the Nazis arrived there, the ethnic Russians stood and fought and died in their hundreds of thousands for Mother Russia. When the Nazis rolled into Stalino, the population was 507,000. And when they were pushed back out two years later, there were only 175,000 citizens left. That is 333,000 ethnic Russian lives that were lost there during the Second World War. So, these young men 
of modern day Donetsk, and I'm not making any excuses for this lot, you may remember that they're, they're the ones who um, shot down a Malaysian airliner in July 2014 using a Russian made missile launcher, killing 283 innocent men, women and children. But these young men who were wearing the colours, by the way, there of Shakhtar Donetsk, the local football team, to show their allegiance to the city. Um, they feel with no little justification that their forefathers paid for that Ukrainian city with their Russian blood. And that's what really sparked the civil war in the Ukraine. And it's Russian blood that was brought to that part of the Ukraine by John Hughes and my grandfather and the rest of the Welsh community more than a century and a half ago. Well, Percy, previously that analytical chemist in Yusufka and now a failed news agent of the 1930s, he survived his bankruptcy with the help of a loan from his father-in-law, Edward Morgan, the grocer from the top of Mount Pleasant Street in Dowlas. Ironically, the steel industry was one of those, uh, one of the few to do quite well in the early 1930s, as Britain rearmed in preparation for the Second World War, and he quickly got a job as an industrial scientist at the Guest Keen Works in Splot in Cardiff, uh, which is why even though I now live in a small village in the South Wales Valleys, I have the accent of someone brought up in the leafy suburbs of Cardiff and, and a bluebird's tattoo as well. Um, they put up a statue to John Hughes in Donetsk, modern day Yusufka, in 2001. And um, they brought out a commemorative stamp in 2013 to mark the anniversary of his birth, although um, no one's entirely sure when that was. And despite the fighting in Donetsk, his house, unoccupied since, since um, 1917, is apparently still there, although um, it looked like this even before the civil war broke out in the Ukraine in 2014. But apart from that, the story of the Welsh community of Yusufka more or less just faded away. Um, that is until 2012, um, two years before the civil war broke out in uh, Ukraine. Uh, when Ukraine uh, found themselves hosting the European Football Championship finals and England, who had qualified for the finals, their first match was in the magnificent Donbass Arena in Donetsk. And the BBC uh, did an item about the city's history and how it had been founded by Welshmen. Um, and they did some digging around and they discovered baby Sandy. Um, having been born in a city of iron, it seemed like um, Sandy had been made out of wrought iron himself because despite a life that included a communist revolution, a world war, a plane crash, a major stroke and two heart attacks, he was still alive at the age of 95. Now, I'm afraid I can't play you the short item that appeared on um, BBC National News uh, that was all about Sandy, um, the last person to be born into the Welsh community of Yusufka. Um, the BBC has deleted the item uh, from their online archive, which is a bit of a shame because Sandy's full name was Edward Morgan Cartwright, and he was my father. 
And this is my favourite photograph of him in his 90s, standing outside the former grocer's shop of Edward Morgan at the top of Mount Pleasant Street in Dowlice. It's now a coffee shop. And my father died peacefully uh, just a couple of months after his fleeting moment of fame. And with him went the last direct link to the Welsh community of Yusufka. And so turned the last page of the last chapter of what I always think is a remarkable little Welsh adventure story. Thank you for listening.